Before we start, let's discuss what procedural generation will do for our game design, or more precisely, what it won't do. You've almost certainly heard how Minecraft is successful because it has infinite content. Respectfully, I disagree with this. I would say that Minecraft worlds have a finite amount of unique content, because the only content it will generate is the content the algorithm is capable of generating. The real value of procedural generation is rearrangement. Instead of perfecting how you play through one single map, you get a shuffled map every single time, forcing you to develop general strategies and engage with the world differently. At any point, you might stumble onto valuable resources, or a giant cave, or some unexpected obstacle. This way of randomly throwing a spanner in the works can promote inventive solutions and negotiations, and random rewards can create high points for the player. I mean, remember finding diamonds back in the day? So that's the true purpose of procedural generation. It's not a core driver of interesting gameplay, but merely an assistant to promote the core loops that do drive interesting gameplay. That said, we still want to make something fun to discover with unexpected and awesome landscapes, even if it's ultimately finite. How can we get more out of our limited content? The trick is to let features interact with each other. Since we know we're already working in a constrained system with finite content, we can maximise the value we get out of that content by allowing all of it to interact and mix, allowing interesting combinations to emerge naturally. This is part of where I think Minecraft went wrong. Minecraft takes a finite amount of pre-made content and restricts it to have specific, carefully directed interactions with other terrain features, leading to a fundamental predictability that makes Minecraft worlds look very samey. So that's how I think about procedural generation. The next step naturally is to implement such a system. I'll save the spicy details for the end of the video, including the ultimate trick for handling chunk boundaries 100% correctly every time, but right now I'm just going to focus on appearance. To begin, let's talk about terrain shaping, the first stage of the process. The goal here is to use noise functions like Perlin noise to create a basic shape out of voxels. Later on, we'll be able to decorate it with grass and carve into it with caves, among other things. The terrain shaping algorithm has three components, regional noise, continental noise, and sea compression. Regional noise gives us the bulk of the visual interest above ground, so I focused most of the noise computation on this step. To start, you can sample a density value using 3D Perlin noise. If the density is above zero, you place a stone block, and if it's below zero, you place an air block. That'll give you a bunch of interesting 3D blobs. There's a secret source that makes this look like hills. If you decrease the density as the Y coordinate increases, you encourage the blobs to be more dense at the bottom and less dense at the top. This gives you a solid floor, an empty sky, and 3D variation in the middle. You can tune the fall off to flatten or expand the terrain. This is already okay, but I wasn't entirely satisfied. I still wanted more cliffs, but I didn't want the terrain to become too blobby or frothy. So let's think about how cliffs form in the real world. Cliffs typically occur at the boundary between hard rock and soft rock. The soft rock is easier to erode, but the hard rock is more persistent. So a cliff is really an erosion discontinuity, which is something we can model. To analogize, low value areas of our Perlin noise are easy to erode, while high value areas of our Perlin noise are harder. Given all this, we shouldn't be too surprised that we're not seeing cliffs, because it's uncommon for dramatic changes to appear in Perlin noise all on its own. As the technical artists, we need to introduce more discontinuities ourselves. So let's generate a second 3D Perlin noise, exactly the same as the first, but with a different seed. The algorithm will blend between the two based on a third 3D Perlin noise, which has a soft and smooth contrast boost to create a fast shift from one noise map to the other. And wouldn't you know it, you can dial this in to make some really nice cliffs. You might notice that I have a placeholder C in some of these pictures. Yes, they're literal water blocks. I don't have a fluid system. When I added a sea level, I found that lots of my cliffs got submerged or crashed straight into the ocean, creating islands rather than those cool Yosemite style cliffs. To address this, I gently push the terrain up and down. It happens slowly over a large area to ensure each local region looks similar, but at continental scale, it keeps the land and ocean at different elevations. Under the hood, I sample a very large 2D Perlin noise that's about 32 times larger than the regional noise. This continental noise is also softly contrasted, just like the cliffs from before, which keeps everything either well above or well below sea level, except along the small strip where the land actually transitions into the ocean. At a large scale, this continental noise really gives the world a lot more structure, but the other thing it does is add a lot of height. In particular, it makes the oceans super deep, which is something that I wanted out of this terrain generator. 
That said, these oceans and transitional areas were still much too steep, with no real beaches or changes in gradient. It didn't look like the water was depositing any sediment, so to speak, which is a bit unnatural looking. To solve this, I wanted to amplify the density ramp effect around sea level, which would thicken the 3D noise into wide beaches. This is where my C compression comes in. I came up with a set of equations that can bend the Y coordinates down around sea level with a smooth increase in speed. Applying this to the density ramp, you can see the terrain fattens out towards sea level. This gives us plenty of space to paint on beaches later. So with that, we have a terrain shape. At some point we might add more controls, but for the time being, this will do. Let's just take a look at the performance. Okay, it's not actually that bad, but given I have a good computer, I would rather it be faster, especially if we're just generating 16 cubed chunks. The slowdown comes from calculating our density function at all 4096 block positions inside of the chunk. There's no universe where doing that will be cheap. The density doesn't actually change that much from block to block, so sampling every block is quite wasteful. Instead, I'll sample the density at just a few points, then join up those points with linear interpolation to fill out the whole space cheaply. This is called upsampling. In our case, I went with a 4 times upsample where the density function is called 125 times rather than 4096 times. Even with the extra complexity of the upsampling, this still runs 10 times faster, so it's well worth it. After the terrain shaping stage, it's time to do topsoiling. Put simply, the topsoil stage replaces the top layers of stone blocks with dirt. For every stone block, we start stepping up in single block increments, trying to find an air block. If we don't find any air blocks within 12 blocks on top of us, we leave the stone block alone because it's underground. Otherwise, if we do find air, we know that the block is close to the surface, so it's a candidate for converting into dirt. You could just do that, and Minecraft does just do that, but I wasn't happy with how this looked near cliffs. Because Daydream has smaller voxels, it's way more obvious when you have single columns of dirt, which looks really ugly. So I look at the four adjacent columns and try to find what elevation they're at. If they're too far away, or if they don't exist at all, then that implies we're on a steep surface, so we won't place the soil here. As a bonus, if we do find an adjacent column, we can use it to measure how steep the slope is and reduce the thickness of the soil layer gradually to make the transition even cleaner. To finish things off, I convert everything below a certain elevation to sand to form some lovely beaches. Using some more Perlin noise, I can even take some sand off the top, letting the beach separate from the mainland to add some interesting elevation. Now, it's time for caves, probably the most important step for our game. Games like Minecraft use Perlin worms for this, but I don't think they're a good fit here, because dark linear corridors are really better suited for combat encounters, which we're not doing, and they aren't nearly as 3D and vertical as I'd like them to be. What I really want is a 3D network of caves with tubular connections and distinct rock faces. Imagine filling a jar with stones and consider the shape of the empty space around the stones. That's kind of what I'm going for, something spongy and full of angles. So I turned to Worley noise. By generating a random infinite Voronoi diagram and using some distance ratios, we can generate some pretty structured tubes and cavities, distort the input position with some Perlin noise, and now you have some really cool cave shapes. They're still highly 3D and have all sorts of fun angles, and they retain their structure without being overly linear. To break up the network a bit, I alternate between two differently seeded Voronoi diagrams. And to make deep caves more fun to explore, I gradually add a constant factor to the noise to open up the caves as you go thousands of blocks down. Finally, I generate two more Voronoi diagrams to generate thin runner caves, which help connect the larger caves to each other and create more cave entrances on the surface. In the future, I'd like to flood these caves with water or magma at various elevations, and I do have algorithms in mind to achieve that, but I'm not looking to implement that right now. So having carved out our caves, it's time to grow some grass. This is pretty simple really, if there's air above dirt, the dirt turns to grass. By doing this after cave generation, the caves can strip away layers of topsoil without stripping away the grass, which is key to ensure the caves don't scar the landscape too much when you're above ground. So finally, we get to talk about trees. In many ways, these are the final boss of any chunked terrain generation system, because they not only require lots of context to find valid spawn points, but they also generate largely across chunk boundaries. I'll talk about how I did this in a bit, but to make a long story short, I built an abstraction for myself that lets me generate trees wherever I like, as long as I set some boundaries on the reading and writing. Throughout the chunk, I test different positions to see if a tree can grow there. The trick is pretty simple, trees must grow on grass, and they must have empty space in a specific area above them. 
To generate the trees, I step up in single block increments, placing logs in the middle to create a trunk. At randomized but regular points, the code starts a branch off of the main chunk, which steps outwards in semi-random directions, and a little bit upwards too. At the end of the trunk and the branches, I generate a blob of leaves to form the canopy. That generates pretty nice trees. For visual interest, I randomized the height of the trees between 6 and 20 blocks, which gives them a nice amount of variance. I also added a birch variant with some lovely yellow leaves, which has a small chance of generating, which breaks up all the green. And also added some fruits for some smaller pops of colour. In the future, I'd like to do a more interesting competition system, where different species of trees prefer different conditions, and better adapted trees have more of a chance to generate than less adapted trees. It doesn't have to be a full simulation, some pollen noise would probably do to emulate different conditions, but it'd help vary how different plants are distributed across the world. So I'm really happy with how this terrain looks. I didn't set out to make the final terrain generation algorithm in one go, but this does start to meaningfully approach the kind of world I imagined this game having. It's not done, but it's not bad. So the thing you're probably dying to know is how I dealt with those chunk boundaries, because they're downright awful to deal with if you don't know what you're doing. The core of the problem is that generating chunked worlds is inherently parallel. Any two chunks might be generated in different orders, by different players, in different threads, in different world files, on different computers, at different times, but they still need to fit together perfectly. In short, we need our chunk generator to be deterministic, that is, it must always produce the same chunk no matter the external conditions, and we need it to be parallel, that is, you can generate the entire thing start to finish at the same time as other chunks. This is incredibly difficult to do in practice, which is why almost nobody does it in practice. Even YouTubers don't do this, and yes Tantan, -tan, I am humorously calling you out for coupling your world state to your terrain generator. As you saw, I divide my terrain generation into many stages, and oftentimes these stages will need to read blocks from other chunks. For example, to figure out whether to replace a block with topsoil, you need to know if there's empty space in the chunk above. As a naive workaround, many people read from chunks in their live world state, which is a terrible sin and you should never do that. Firstly, waiting on high traffic shared state can kill performance. Secondly, any gameplay simulation that happens in the world can affect your terrain generator and alter the way things generate. And thirdly, you can create cyclic race conditions and dependencies between chunks, which at best introduces non-determinism and at worst pings off to infinity and crashes your game, or at least makes it chug really badly. Instead, you should always generate a fresh chunk. This can be contained entirely within the same thread, no problem at all, and it won't be affected by anything happening in the live game. And to prevent any cyclic dependencies, you can employ a simple rule. You can only see what previous stages look like. If you're generating trees, it's okay to see what the top soiling stage did, but if you tried to see what the tree stage did, then that'd be an infinite loop and it would end badly. This does mean if you want to be perfectly deterministic, then you have to take snapshots of the chunk after each generation stage, so you don't inadvertently leak details about what later stages did. It has to be totally church and state. You must never look into the future. With that observation, I built a system that implements all of that. Each generation stage can specify how many blocks around the chunk it needs to read, and with that information, I know for example that grass generation will need the results of the previous generation stage for both this chunk and the chunk above it. When the game asks for a chunk, I can figure out which locations need to be generated and what stages they need to be generated up to. If the necessary snapshots exist, then the cached snapshot can be returned, but otherwise, anything that's missing is scheduled to be generated, with the earlier stages going first. The later stages only generate when they have all the snapshots they need from earlier stages, as they declared earlier by specifying the number of blocks around the chunk that they need. The awesome thing is that those intermediate snapshots don't have to be shared between threads or even saved long term. They can just be generated on demand as many times as needed and disposed of whenever we need to free up the memory. The caching is an optimization rather than a fundamental necessity. So there's just one remaining problem. What about something like a tree which might start inside the chunk but bloom out into adjacent chunks? It's true that each generation stage can still only write to the blocks inside its own chunk, but this turns out to not be a problem in practice due to the concept of scatter as gather. In short, our tree generator is a scatter operation, one thread writing out to multiple locations. Another example might be a Gaussian blur, where individual pixels scatter information out to nearby pixels. It's the most natural way to write many operations, but it requires sharing mutable memory, which tends to involve expensive locks. Most parallel architectures, whether CPU threads or GPU shaders, don't play well with scatter operations. Instead, they perform best by doing 
gather operations, where one thread is reading from multiple locations. As an example, instead of each pixel scattering its colour to nearby pixels, each pixel could independently look at all the nearby colours and combine them on its own. While this inevitably duplicates some computation, it doesn't matter, because being totally independent means all the computation can be done all at once, without mutable shared memory, which is why everything you do in a fragment shader is almost certainly a gather operation rather than a scatter operation. So how does this apply to us? Well, our tree generator is a scatter operation. Information about the tree starts from this chunk and emanates outwards into other chunks. What we need to do is reframe it as a gather operation by having each chunk independently pull in the blocks that make up the tree. That's what my abstraction does. It reads in blocks from nearby chunks and discovers all the spawn points for trees who could intersect with this chunk. It then runs the process to generate all of those trees, and if any blocks land in the chunk, they're written into the buffer. Because the process is fully deterministic, the tree will generate the same way each time, ensuring it all lines up every single time. As a result of this architecture, there's practically no load time. The world is ready to go almost immediately after starting, and as I walk around, the new chunks are generated in almost a single step. I know it's overused these days, but genuinely, this is blazing fast, and I couldn't be happier with it. There is something I could be happier with though. The rendering's looking a little bit tired, which makes sense because it's mostly still the MVP renderer, so it's pretty minimal. Also, the physics is quite buggy, and you just get stuck sometimes, which really sucks when you're exploring because it softlocks you and forces you to close the game. I'd like to solve some of those problems in the future, but in the meantime, I have something to show you. Actually, three things. I've spent many years studying the music of Minecraft and breaking down how it works. What I've realised is that the best tracks don't literally describe what's on the screen, but instead evoke the emotions you're meant to feel. That's the reason Minecraft is ambient rather than chiptune. But beyond that, and this is seldom talked about, the instrumentation is just as important. Minecraft isn't just piano music, though it certainly has piano. It's much more about FM synthesis, which is a kind of digital instrument. All those lush pads and soft sounds you hear all come from an FM synth, and it's the way those synths mix into the natural instruments that makes Minecraft music so ethereal. I could go on for much longer talking about attention management, ostinati, and other composition and production things, but I figured that'd get too in the weeds for this channel. So instead, I decided to produce some demo tracks, and you can listen to them right now. They're designed to play with synths and acoustic instruments in much the same way that Minecraft does, but with my own compositions. My hope is that I can capture the same vibe, but with new compositions and high quality instruments. I'll talk more about music and sound design at a later date, probably when I actually implement it, but for now, head over to the new Daydream channel to hear all the tracks so far. They're still drafts, but I hope you enjoy them nonetheless. The links should be on screen right now. I'll see you there.